Hi, this is Denise Burton with the Department, Nevada Department of Education, Office of Career Readiness, Adult Learning and Education Op Options. I'm recording this Quality Program Review Evidence Collection presentation that was done at NAFD this year. So, um, this is my, I'm the Education Program Professional Overskilled in Technical Sciences as well as the quality program reviews for the CTE office. We're going to look for some quality professional learning. You'll be able to view this at your leisure. Um, we're trying to expand access to CTE for all students and communicate our programmatic impact through these quality program reviews. So I hope it will be helpful to you. The plan here is to just go over some basics of evidence collection, what's good evidence, give you some examples, some resources, um, and then if you have questions, I'll post an email where you can reach out to me. First, we're going to start with the basics of evidence collection. And where to start is your self-assessment. So when you start with your self-assessment, you'll note that there's um, some examples of evidence that are listed here. I've pointed to them here. Um, one piece of evidence is required for each indicator. So there's some examples that you can use. You don't have to use these. You can have something else. You're just looking for things that will answer or respond to the indicator that's listed. And you can read through the, um, the meets and the needs and the highly effective, the rubric here, to help you respond to these, um, to these indicators. So you want to include your self-assessment in your evidence, that's part of it, and I'll give you a little hint that responds to indicator 8.1, so that would be where you might want to put it. Um, you're going to have one program specific item per indicator, that's what's required, and you want to make sure it responds to your program, not your, like for the program teachers, it should not be your overall um, school information, you want it related to your program. The, uh, the next one is submitting your evidence for each of the indicators. So you're going to have to have one for every single um, indicator. I know it's a lot, but sometimes you can use the same um, evidence. That it, You can have the same piece of evidence for more than one indicator if it's appropriate. You have to remember that if you're an administrator, you're, typically your view is looking at school-wide information. That may not be relevant to the teacher who's looking at the program information. So just be sure that you stay in context with, um, with your evidence, which we're going to talk about next. Um, your evidence needs to, be, it needs to be in context. So if only um, a pro for this one, programs of study and guide students to program completion. If you provide the program of study sheet as a teacher, um, I don't know how if those courses are being offered or not. And so with the school, it's kind of the same thing. If you're the counselor, then you provide the program of sequence. That might make more sense for you because at least I understand that the counselors understand that it's a program of study and not one class. So if you were a CTE teacher, you might think of listing your um, courses from IC showing that you teach all three levels. Or you, or you or the admin may list from the catalog what levels are, um, are put as options for the students. So you want to make sure that, that you're putting the information that relates the best to your, what your role is in the CTE programs. So you want to kind of look at the indicators and look at you know, what's being required. So this says the meet, the meet standard is the courses are fully sequenced to create an improved CT program of study. So the program of study sheet from our website is what we want it to be. But if you're not offering all of those courses at your school, then that really does not respond to this indicator because maybe you're in a first year of your program. Then for that situation, you really aren't offering fully sequenced and there's a reason for it and you can write that in your, um, in your self-assessment, but we have to score based on what the current condition is. And 
As I want to remind everybody throughout all of this, none of this is punitive. We are just collecting data based on what's really there, and that's what we're looking for. So, um, so just remember to keep your evidence in context with the indicator that you're trying to provide it for. PII should not be on any of the information that's submitted to us through the drive that you're going to upload, okay? Um, we don't really need it for any of these pieces of evidence. PII is like student names, student ID numbers, those kinds of things. Just black them out, that's fine. Like you can show me your IC, your, your maybe your list for your class, and you can black out those columns. I still can see how many students are there, how many male, how many female, what the total number is. I can, uh, um, I can see the name of the class. All that is what I need. I don't need individual student information. So if you have to put, if you feel like you have to put something with PII in it, it has to be uploaded to Big Hornet and you'll have to get with your district to do that. And you'll need to notify me it's there because otherwise I, I don't get a notification that you're submitting something for Big Horn. My preference is you just don't, just black it out. Don't use it at all. Um, the evidence submission rule is the only really thing that is changing this year. Um, we're going to be submitted it, submitting it or uh, uploading it to what's called Midas. And it, it will be fairly simple. There's like three things they'll have to fill out. The school um, and, and the um, contact information of who uploaded it. And then you will put a link a shared drive, a link to a shared drive, whether it's Google, OneDrive, a Dropbox, any of those are fine, into Midas. You need to just make sure that your teachers um, and everyone is submitting stuff that it they've opened up the sharing so that it published it so that it can be it can be viewed, those kinds of things. So that would be the only issue. So just make sure that you're doing that so that it's able to be opened and then you will upload that drive with all of your programs for your school in that one drive. So these are just some naming conventions. Um, the school, you'll need to have that. That will be the name of your drive. And then each program area, your choice, you can have a folder for each program area if you prefer, that's fine. Um, at the minimum, you need to label it like I have here with the program name, underscore the standard, and then the indicator. So for example, culinary arts, underscore two for the standard, and then basically that's 2.2, .2, and then it's a PDF file. So um, that's how you'll name it. If you name them this way, you don't have to do separate folders because they'll sort together with each program area, but it's up to you. I'm okay with the additional folders. Um, but this is the naming convention that we would like to see. You'll get more information on the MIDAS um, uploads as we move a little bit closer to evidence being submitted. So that's the basics. So let's figure out how you pick what the appropriate evidence is. You know, what is appropriate evidence and how do you choose it? We're going to go back again to the self-assessment. So one thing I said was start your self-assessment, submit your self-assessment, uh, section 8.1 is there's an annual program evaluation using input from key stakeholders and student performance reports, etc. That's your self-assessment. So if you have your annual program for meet standard, annual program occurs to ensure instructional objectives and goals are being met. If you are reflecting back on your practices and um, looking for areas that you may see gaps, you may want to change things, that meets the standard. To go to highly effective, you would have to be taking those results and compiling them and utilizing them for program improvement and disseminating them to stakeholders. So for example, if you have more than one teacher in your program area and you guys all collect your self-assessments, you take your data, you start talking about it, and you look at ways that you can improve the program together, that would, be, that would take care of, um, of a highly effective. Or if you are, if you have an advisory board at your school and you take that information, you bring it to them and you share it with them, again, that would be highly effective. But if you are submitting it here, you go through the process, it's a practice you do every year and it's provided um, on the quality program review, that would cover meets. So um, again, this is how we look at the 
This is how we look at the evidence. This is what I do when I'm reviewing it. I start with the self-assessment. I start with the standard. I read the indicator. And then I read the definitions on the rubric. And then I look at the evidence that's provided. And I say to myself, you know, does it meet this, meet the meet standard? And does it provide the additional information that, that I need to make it highly effective? So that's, that's the process that I use. Um, and I think that's a good process for when you're picking your evidence. So here's some more, here's some more indicators with some examples. I'm not going to do every indicator because, of course, that would take a long time. <laughs> and we're actually working on a Canvas course that will have information for every indicator. So that hopefully will be available mid-August. Um, so we'll start with 1.3 and 1.4. These are looked at by both the counselor and the teacher. Um, so 1.3 is a collaboration of stakeholders. And what this is is the coordination between the student the CT instructor and the counselor on the student's academic plans. So we want to see if there's coordination being going on between those three stakeholders. So some evidence can include schedules showing meeting with the students um, and the, or the instructors from the counselors. So for example, if the counselors typically call every student in um, during the month of January, whichever it is, and you have that in your calendar and you maybe pop into the classrooms and say we're going to be calling everybody in, this is what we're going to do, or you have, have something you send out to the teachers, that would show collaboration between the teacher, the student, and the counselor. If it just happens between the student and the counselor, that's still going to be meets, but that would be what you would show for that. Um, if it happens just with the teacher, maybe the teacher just looks at the recommendations or talks to the students about that. Those are all things. Or maybe you guys come in and the teacher does a, maybe the teacher does a lesson on how to stay through the program for all three years or how the program progresses and what the, something like that. That's still talking about their academic planning. If the counselor comes into the program area and does the same thing, then you're collaborating with all three. So this is really looking at what level of collaboration or coordination is happening between those three stakeholders. And it is in regards to the academic planning for those students in their program area. For 1.4, we're still looking at the coordination between those same stakeholders, but now we're talking about how they learn about career development. So um, all the CT programs have, have you know, standards that talk about careers within their within their program area. And so there's teacher lessons, I'm sure, on those. If they're collaborated with the counselor using career inventories, career guidance activities, career investigation activities, um, you want to show that integration with all three, if it's the teacher doing it, or maybe the counselor just calls the students out at different times, and so it's just the counselor and the students. That's what we need, that's what we're trying to look for there. So um, that evidence may be different for the instructor and for the counselor, maybe the same if you guys work together, but that's some things to consider with those two. In the next area, um, 2.0, we're looking more at instruction in the classroom. So the first one we're talking about there is the pro CT program elements. A lot of times this is um, something that teachers aren't really familiar with or they don't really realize that they have what they have. Basically, we're looking at in your in your class expectations, do you also talk about the program? Like how do you get your students to understand they're in a program of study and not just a course? So if you look at your class expectations and you include things like your program description and your program goals along with your course objectives and the learning outcomes, which are in a typical, you know, stand um, uh, class expectations. A lot of times, um, teachers don't really know that they have these things that they um, that are already there. It's nothing extra to do. So look at your course expectations, and, and a lot of times you may have three out of those, but that fourth one really comes from the program. So you want to try to relate your program to also to your course expectations if possible. Um, the next one is 2.7, which relates to instructional improvement. And this goes back to what data you're using to um, help guide your instruction. 
So one of the key things we're looking for here is do you use your in the program data or your WRS, your workplace writing skills data to bring back to your classroom to know where to fill in gaps. So the picture provided here is from a construction technology program and one thing they noted from their in the program results was the students didn't understand the terminology of some of the tools. And so what they did, and it's probably hard to see on the video, but what they did was they took their tool closet and they went in and they started labeling things. So the students, when they go to grab those tools, they're going to automatically notice the terminology they're supposed to be using. Um, so that was something they did to come back into their classroom and make changes to show that adjustment. So anything you can show that you're doing, for example, you could take the results and then connect it to the lesson if you keep your lessons and just make a note on there that, you know, next year I need to expand this lesson. We need to, you know, come up with some new ideas um, or add in a section that you hadn't done previously. And if those are notes or reflections in your lesson plans, that also shows that um, sometimes you can look at your SLG that you're using um, and see if that can be used to show um, show how you're adjusting your teaching based on your on your uh, performance data. <coughs> Excuse me. Work-based learning, this is hard for people that they don't always understand the critical definitions here, but basically we're looking for things that attach to industry. And this would be things like um, speakers, they can be virtual, they don't have to be in person. Um, field trips, again, virtual is good virtual simulations or computer-based simu simulations are also good. Um, it's not just writing a resume, but if you had a full um, activity where they were doing a mock interview, where they had to write the resume, they had to dress, dress professionally, brought people from outside to listen to them and interview them, that would be a work-based learning activity. So the difference is it's not just a one thing and it has to have some connection to industry. Um, and then 2.11 is industry certifications. And um, you need to make sure that the, um, that you can provide, you provide them as much as you can. So there's a list of certifications on the GOIN website that will, you know, provide you with everything that's available. Um, they've just updated it, so it's, it's many pages long. <laughs> Um, but these are things like OSHA, the C++ certification, ASE, ServSafe, just to name a few. And if you're having trouble finding certifications that might help your students, please reach out and we'll, um, we will help you as well. So all of our EPPs know what certifications are out there and we can help you try to connect you with some. Also check with your district because they know them as well. 3.0 is leadership, and this really re relates directly to CTSOs. And so the main one here, this is a trigger, which means you don't get recognition if you don't need it, um, is the CTSO establishment. So if there's, there's it's a requirement that for career tech um, programs, the students are supposed to have the opportunity to participate in the appropriate CTSO. If you're not sure what CTSO um, works for your program area, check your program of study on the website and the programs are listed in there as to what ones are appropriate. Um, they're having them at your school, but not being par not participating as a teacher puts your students to a disadvantage. So there has to be a chapter at your school. The advisor should be the teacher. The teacher should advise at least their students for their CTSO, so advisor participation can be your membership card. Establishment can be your invoice. Um, you can cut off the names. I've cut off the names here, but it shows the invoice. It shows that it's FFA. It gives a date. It should be current year information, not last year um, or the year before. Um, we look at the membership, and, and I will say that these are co-curricular activities. You can work on your CTSO in class. They have leadership curriculum. Um, it's you can use you can use contests as projects. You know you can work on them that way. So if you if your students are all members, then you're going to have 100% because they're all members and they work on it in class, right? So you'd have 100% membership 
and 100% participation because participation locally at your school is just as important as participation at the regional, state, and national competitions. It's not all about the competitions. We feel like that CTSOs are important to build leadership and to build um, understanding of what's in the industry. And all of those things happen by participating in CTSOs. So this is the evidence <coughs> and it shows, this would show the membership, um, advisor participation. If you have a, either an invoice showing you as an advisor or a membership card, some CTSOs require you to be a member, that's fine. Your membership list, so we need to know that your which programs, which students are in. So if you give me a list with just a bunch of names, no programs on it, I can't tell which one of those are your students and what programs that list goes to because many of the CTSOs are split up based on, um, are, are, there's multiple programs in the CTSO. And then um, participation, that percentage is based on the number of the participation of membership. So if you have 25 kids participating and 20 of them um, are actively participating, even at the school level, then that's like 80% particip participation. So um, uh, please reach out to your CTSO state advisors. If you need data or you need something to help you provide this evidence, I've been speaking to them and they said that they can provide you lists based on your program areas. So, and they're happy to do that. So please, please reach out. And if you don't know who that is, send me an email and I'll help you find them. Here's an example of the evidence. And hopefully you look at this and you say, what's missing? Why couldn't they use this evidence? Well, they've got the date. I locked out the school. It doesn't say what the CTSO is. That's a problem, right? It also doesn't have any programs listed. So I can't use this because number one, I don't know what CTSO it is. And number two, I don't know what programs those students would be connected to. So that's an example of evidence that would need to be revised. Um, Okay, in section five, we're looking at budgeting, <clears throat> and 5.1 is basically for administrators, and we're looking here to see how the administrators uh, work with their teacher and their school district um, to create their CTE budgets. That's the only part we're talking about, not the whole school budget, none of that. We're just looking at CTE funding, and so we're, we're looking to see if it's developed collaboratively. So if the district and the principal work on it together, that's somewhat collaborative, um, and that would probably get you to a meet, but to get to a highly effective, it would need to also include the teachers, the program teachers. So um, how you do that is completely up to you as the administrator. There's no, I have no requirements on that. It's just that if they're, if it's, you want to look to see if you're working on it with the teachers or if you're just giving the budget to the teachers or if you're telling them what they can buy without, with or without their input. So input would equal collaboration. <laughs> so that's um, one thing, but, um, and it should include all, all the funding for all aspects of the program. That includes professional development, CTSOs, equipment, maintenance, supplies, and materials. Um, if there's no discussion with the teachers, there may be a lack of knowledge of what really needs to happen. So for the meets, again, there should be a collaborative development by a teacher and the administrator in the district. Like a request for a wish list would be a minimum. Like if you're not, if you're just going to ask them what they want, that's fine. Um, maybe, maybe something where everybody gets together. If maybe you guys are looking at how to prioritize the funding that's available. Maybe that's a discussion amongst a team of people. Maybe that's a discussion amongst a couple of people or the teacher and the administrator the teacher, the administrator, and the district. However you guys want to do it, we're just looking to see if there's any collaboration done for that part. And then 5.2 is for the teachers, and we want to know if the teachers understand what's, what can and cannot be purchased through the funding that's available and what ones are available. So if they give me um, that they, know, that they um, downloaded those forms, that's helpful. I know some of the districts put together a guidance document for that. That's helpful. Any of those things would show evidence that the teachers have some understanding 
of what can and cannot be purchased through the funds and what funding avenues are available. Um, section six is mostly about <coughs> the program area and safety and equipment, but there's one in there that a lot of times gets missed. And this is 6.5, which is the program and equipment enhancement. So what we're looking for is, is there a local plan in place for programs and for program and equipment enhancement? So this is an example here of something that one of the schools put together and they um, graciously allowed me to share it of what they look at so that they know, you know, when things are going to come up and especially major pieces of equipment, how long of life they have, what it's going to cost to replace them. Um, you know, is there annual maintenance expense, those kinds of things. And this helps them watch for those needs to fill things in at certain periods of time. Um, those wish lists, again, can come in. If your teacher has a has wish lists, if the teacher has wish lists of how they want that program to go, that they can, you know, see that. I mean, when I was teaching, I had this idea, this great idea of having a whole wall of 3D printers. Nobody was going to give me 10 3D printers. But if I knew how many I wanted, every year I could ask for one or two, and, you know, it would eventually get them built up, and they would get in, like, a replacement mode. And so those are things to think about. So if you have that, a wish list that you keep for your for when people say, hey, what would you like? That's a great start to a, to a program equipment enhancement plan. Um, if your school has a plan, that would be appropriate here as well. If it's just your own program plan, your wish list is a program plan, that would be great too. So any of those kinds of things would be great pieces of evidence. Um, <coughs> I'm not even going to go over the 7.1 through 4. Those are district level, and if the districts have them, they have them, and if they don't, they don't. It is what it is, um, and we accept that. So 7.5 would be a joint technical skills advisory committee if at your school you have a committee that or if the district does but where you include um, uh, maybe the, a college or or some industry people where they get involved with your school and they help advise you on how your programs um, should go maybe help with business and industry uh, connections and those kinds of things minutes and agendas are great pieces of evidence for these two items and the other one is the program level so if your district has you guys meet together at program level, an, a minutes or a, an agenda, either one, would be appropriate for these two items. And then in 8.2 um, student feedback, so this is collected and reviewed, and if you want highly effective, you're looking at how that information, how you use it to plan and evaluate and improve your CT program. So if you collect information from your students related to how to improve, and this could be all of your students, um, and I know a lot of us did, you know, I used to do end of year reflections and things like that, and then you can show how you, how you use that information, um, you know, what you do with it, that would get you to highly effective. If you collect it and you look at it, that's meets. If you do something with it, that gets you up to highly effective. And then student follow-up to determine student placement and the effectiveness of your program. This is relating mostly to the kids leaving and that have completed your program um, and their input. So some kind of a follow-up system to see, do you know where they go? Do they go to college? Do they go to a job? Do they, you know, want to come back and talk to your students? Like, because they're working in their field and they're doing great. That's always good, a good problem to have. So those two things, that's their explanation. Um, any, anything like what kind of surveys you use or the collection of the information and maybe if you've done some sort of analysis and you like pick some things you want to do next year, that would be great. Those would be some things um, on the feedback that would show evidence. Um, 8.5 through 8.8 .8 is data collection. For the purpose of the quality program review visits, you do not have to collect this information. We collect this information. Um, and we just remember there are scored on both participation and pass rates for your end of program assessment and your workplace readiness assessment. We're all also looking, um, and it's not the but 8.4 is, um, is the retention, how, the ones that complete, concentrate and then complete. So those are things that are collected by us. As you do this process every year with your annual report, you should look at that data. For the purpose of quality program you visit, you do not have to collect this data. We will provide it. 
So some of the best practices um, are doing your self-assessments annually. It's a great reflection tool. It's a great practice for your programs. If you're making notes of things as you go along, that could be good evidence. Then when you have to do evidence for a visit, you have a place to start. Um, as you're doing your visits this year, please turn in your evidence complete and on time. That allows us the most efficient use of the time on site. If we can review everything before we get there, um, then we were able to provide you with some upfront notes before we get there. And we're able to really dig into the areas where we can provide some technical assistance or where we can really investigate something awesome you're doing so we can share with others um, and things like that. So we want to use that time in the interview so that it's most as efficient as possible so that we're not wasting your time um, on site. Um, and then please use the naming formats that I showed earlier. That just helps us be efficient in doing the evidence reviews and keeping the, everything together. Um, again, the evidence should be program specific and everything should be in context to the indicator. And then use what you have. Uh, again, it's not punitive in any way. I want to I want to see what you're doing in your program and then we'll figure out how that meets or how maybe there's some technical assistance needed. Maybe you've done something nobody's even thought about. That's awesome. So we want to see what you're doing. You don't have to make up new stuff for us. Um, it's not about checking a box. It's about looking at the programs, seeing where there's their gaps, seeing where there are good things happening, celebrating those and filling in those gaps. Um, you only need one piece of evidence per indicator. Please make it easy on yourself and don't collect massive amounts of data that you don't need. Stick to the one piece per indicator and that would be the best way to do it. There are some resources here. Um, again, I'm recording this to upload to Indies YouTube, so if, you, if you're reading this, you already found it. Um, there will be a webinar coming up mid-August and I'll be notifying the districts of that soon. And um, the, all of the documents are at this page, so if you need any of them, they're there. Uh, here's a couple of QR codes. Hopefully they work on the video. There's access to this presentation if you want to download it. Um, the PDF is there. If you want to fill out the survey, that was done for NACTI, but I'd love to get your input, so that's there. And then if you have any questions, this is my email address. This is my office phone. I would suggest that you email me. If you want to talk to me, please just send me a number and a time that would be best to call you. Um, I'm working remotely most of the time right now, so I'm not at the office phone that often. So um, if you could just leave that information, you send me an email, leave, give me a number, and I'll call, I'll call you back. All right? I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much, and I, hope, I can't wait to see you guys all on the in-person site visits and the virtual interviews later this year. Thank you.